Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the next installment of uh, Introduction to Stargazing. And I thought I'd uh, do a little bit of uh, eye candy rolling through instead of uh, just watching uh, uh, me do my little spiel about um, that in... Um, Originally, we had hoped to do these sessions at the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, but due to COVID, we've uh, gone into uh, virtual mode. But the idea is uh, for these sessions to um, introduce you to the sky and run you through the Explore the Universe um, certificate and pin. And... Um, essentially to cover a few topics and uh, that there's no requirements uh, to remember what happened uh, last month or if you're joining for the first time you can just get on this end of the uh, carousel and um, keep on um, uh, learning uh, for the next uh, upcoming months and so um, Today we will be uh, talking a little bit about the uh, face on the moon, uh, Mercury, and uh, some uh, International Space Station passes. So um, with, um, with that, I will stop sharing that screen and go back to uh, uh, my main out. Um, and uh, just as, as a sort of a reminder, a lot of what we're doing here gets covered. I know you can't see this in detail, but it's Explore the Universe. And there's a, a guide from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And if you uh, print out the uh, and download the PDF for Explore the Universe certificate, um, you will find that bit by bit as we go through this, we'll accomplish much on the what's on the certificate. And you'd be able to essentially, with just a little bit more uh, stargazing, hand it in and get yourself a certificate and pin from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And uh, today's uh, topic, we will start right away, get back to my screen. If I can find it again. There we go, share. And... There we go. Fine. Okay, so full moon, here we go. And I'm gonna move my, there we go. Um, now, uh, as the moon goes uh, around the earth, the uh, phase changes and we're happening to hit full moon uh, uh, as we are right now. But I thought I'd uh, look a little bit at the faces on the moon or the shapes on the moon. And of course, um, the uh, any kind of imaginings we see, the man in the moon has been around for many, many years. And uh, how you see it will be different from how other people see it, but it's uh, essentially uh, the way that our brain uh, takes on um, images that, and uh, tries to make sense out of them. So it's pretty natural uh, that uh, since we're a very gregarious uh, animal that we uh, tend to see uh, faces and animals in uh, everything from uh, the moon to clouds, of course, or, or spilt milk even makes uh, patterns. And so um, uh, it, it's always been, uh, for me, my two uh, most obvious types of uh, facial patterns in the full moon is either uh, just a face a head, or uh, this rabbit. You know, the ears are here, head here, body around. Uh, depending on your eyesight, you may even get to see a little tuft in uh, one of these. And so to, since I didn't have the full moon when I was drawing these, I just printed out a, 
uh, a picture, put it at the other end of the room until I couldn't quite see the details in it and it sort of became a little uh, tougher to see and then I uh, sketched away at um, what I saw. Uh, one of the most uh, notable features about uh, the uh, face uh, in the moon is that as soon as you put binoculars on it, the illusion sort of disappears because you then see too much detail. But everybody's going to see uh, uh, something slightly different depending partly on your culture, uh, depending partly on what uh, your parents uh, were describing when they were showing you the full moon when you were a kid. So the rabbit is a fairly uh, common one. Uh, this face is rather complicated compared to uh, what uh, what I see. This one here is fairly similar to um, what uh, uh, I've come up with, um, but the more recent one is Wilma Flintstone. Um, and uh, uh, apparently once you see it, it's very difficult to shake and you'll see uh, Wilma from, uh, from now on. For example, I can now see her eyes there, mouth there, hair going out that way, and of course a pearl, which happens to be Tycho. So you're actually, there are some sort of real features that uh, you're seeing. Um, and so it's kind of nice that over time you actually uh, learn what the names of uh, the features are as well. Uh, and this is completely normal in facial recognition in objects that, in inanimate objects out there, is that it's very common just to disregard a whole bunch of detail because it doesn't sort of fit in with uh, what you're uh, seeing. But uh, the, the, to me, the sunken eye here is uh, mare imbrium. Um, and then uh, the, the right eye is kind of uh, either sort of one or both of uh, uh, sea of tranquility and serenity in there. And generally, we tend to ignore mare chrysium in uh, these uh, 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 pattern recognition um, views. But it all depends. And sometimes you'll note uh, when the moon uh, in its orbit, we're either a little above it or a little below it uh, relative to the illumination from the sun. And we get to see Mare Chrysium sometimes very obviously, uh, as we are actually uh, in the next couple of nights. Um, and then sometimes it's tucked right against the edge and is, uh, all, you need binoculars to notice it. And it's actually remarkable that uh, the ancients really did not um, uh, notice that uh, apparent uh, rocking motion that uh, we call libration. So uh, that's uh, uh, your homework for uh, uh, this month is uh, in the next uh, few nights, uh, go and look at the uh, full moon, especially when it's rising. I find the, um, the, the face one is a lot more obvious. Uh, and when it's high in the sky, the, the rabbit seems to uh, jump out a little uh, at me a bit more. But sometimes it's also the tilt uh, when it's um, sort of tilted. Um, a little bit more to the left, the rabbit jumps out, and when it's a little tilted a bit more to the right, to me, the face jumps out. So give it a try and uh, see what, uh, what you come up with. Okay, um, going to uh, um, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what's uh, in the uh, sky. Uh, we'll uh, just uh, start off in the evening here. Uh, over in the uh, southwest, we have the brilliant Jupiter, and it's uh, at the moment sidekick Saturn. Really keep an eye on this over the next two months, and uh, they will get closer and closer um, right up until the uh, December equinox. Just coincidentally, the equinox on the Earth has nothing to do with the spacing of the planets uh, in the sky, but uh, the, it'll be one of their closest conjunctions in uh, many a decade. Um, and uh, the other thing that uh, I'll be uh, pointing out here, our sort of constellation of the month is the square of Pegasus. But uh, first, your attention is going to be 
uh, drawn by the blazing Mars, which uh, is, uh, has just passed its uh, closest uh, approach to Earth for this round. And um, so it's uh, at its brightest because it's closest to us. So it's also fairly close, closer to the sun. Uh, so it's uh, at its peak brightness and actually uh, rivals uh, Jupiter. But uh, the attention that I uh, wanted to bring is just above it, because uh, you'll have to end up uh, rotating the chart a bit. When you face Mars, you actually want to put the bottom of the chart uh, right below it. Uh, so then Mars will be up. And above it will be the great square of Pegasus, or in its current orientation, it'll be a big baseball diamond. But baseball is past since uh, the pennant is done, um, but it's still a, a, a big diamond. Um, and so the, Pegasus, the square of Pegasus is uh, one of the more recognizable uh, features, uh, star patterns in the sky. Uh, the square is just part of the constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse uh, from Greek mythology. Um, and um, the, uh, it's very useful for finding your way around the sky, especially if you're hunting for either globular star clusters or galaxies, because uh, uh, the, the nice uh, shape is uh, very easy to recognize and uh, points the way to other things. For example, uh, if you want to find Aquarius, go down the chain where there's a, a big capital Y on its side and just below that belongs to Aquarius. Um, where we're going to um, shift now, oh, right. Uh, sorry, uh, um, before we get to um, uh, one more thing, we're gonna uh, look at morning uh, things and uh, we're going, we are now entering um, some really nice passes of the International Space Station. And so, uh, for example, uh, tomorrow morning, but it, I think it'll be too cloudy tomorrow morning. Uh, but at any rate, uh, we're, uh, I'll show you in a second, we've got uh, quite a few passes. So this is on the Heavens Above um, website. And uh, it will show you all the passes of the International Space Station. When you uh, log in, you can log in as guest or have uh, uh, save your location. But make sure you, you put in uh, Edmonton, do a search for it. Otherwise, you'll get passes uh, from uh, the uh, uh, equatorial regions. And it won't apply here. But uh, the key thing here that I want to point out is that uh, the space station will come out of the shadow and right into Orion uh, on, on these nice passes. And it will be uh, brilliant, um, almost as bright as Venus and brighter than Mars. So it's uh, super bright. And then uh, off it goes uh, to uh, the east where it'll uh, pass by Venus. And um, I got this slightly out of order. Um, Sorry, so I'll go back. No, something, oh, it skipped on me, I think. Nope, sorry about that. Um, what, um, so, so at any rate, there is a, uh, sorry, a, a, a week long uh, set of nice passes of the International Space Station right through, um, uh, Orion in the morning. But in the evening here, the great square of Pegasus, which I've uh, made bold by the, the darker ones, um, take the diagonal home plate, uh, come down through Mars, and if you go the same distance, you'll end up at one of the neat variable stars, Mira, which is at maximum. It should be around uh, third or fourth magnitude and a nice uh, sort of uh, orangey uh, uh, color to it. And it's a long period variable. It takes a, a, about a year to go from uh, maximum to minimum. And this is one of these stars that uh, expands and contracts. So that's where we find that. Um, shifting over to uh, the, the primary topic here is um, Mercury. Mercury is coming up to a wonderful 
apparition. And uh, what we mean by an apparition is that it appears, um, but uh, the fancy term is apparition. And so Mercury uh, can be uh, very tricky to find, except when it's really nice and bright and there's other things that help point the way. But uh, here's uh, from a couple of years ago, an evening apparition of Mercury and, and Venus. Venus is the brighter one here. Mercury is the slightly fainter. So Mercury is considerably fainter than Venus, but it will, Mercury will be for a little while uh, just about as bright as the brightest stars in the sky. And I'll show you in a moment here where to uh, look for it. I think I have to exit this. Oh, I've got to share my screen again. Sorry about that. And we'll choose the guide. So uh, this is this piece of software is actually quite old. I think it's uh, back, it started back in the 1990s. But there may be better uh, uh, software out there than Guide. But it's uh, something that I'm just completely familiar with, so I stick with it. So um, here we are. I just have to change the size a little bit to get the bottom of the screen on. Second of November, so uh, just about right away. And uh, the sun is below the horizon here. This, uh, the time is um, just after 6.30, so between 6.30 and 7, when the sky is starting to get a, a very nice uh, glow to it. Uh, 6.30 is uh, uh, probably the best time, but of course, over the next two weeks, um, it will get darker and darker at 6.30. So 6.40 will become um, a, a nice time a little later in the week. But the things uh, to notice, Venus will be super bright, um, obviously, and uh, it will kind of uh, guide the way. You can pretty much at any twilight figure out roughly where the sun is because the, the twilight sky sort of um, gets brighter and brighter towards where the sun is. So if you just sort of follow that angle, you're not going to see all those stars, but you should see a pair of stars here. One of them is Spica, of, uh, and that's the brightest star in uh, Virgo. And uh, it's a beautiful blue-white uh, sparkly star, and next to it will be the similarly bright Mercury. Uh, however, Mercury will be more of a tan uh, sand color, and it shouldn't twinkle as much as Spica unless the atmosphere is really, really turbulent. But what will happen over the next few days here is that um, the uh, and we'll just throw in an animation. And just I'll advance it sort of day by day here. And sort of what you'll see is um, essentially Spica will be moving up relative to the planets uh, moving down. Now you won't see uh, so much. I should actually um, step back here and uh, I should uh, anchor my animation on the sun. And we'll go moon. We'll get back to here. And uh, sorry about that. Oh, silly me. Uh, I do not want that. I want to be anchored on the horizon. Um, so uh, as the, the days go by, Spica will be rising up Mercury will be uh, essentially um, floating in that part of the sky for quite a few days or mornings. 
And uh, so you'll, but it'll also be getting brighter and brighter. And it, it will hit uh, essentially peak brightness on the 10th. Um, sorry, that's not true. It will be highest in the sky on the 10th. Sorry about that. Um, and it will uh, continue to brighten as it gets closer to the sun. And so uh, Mercury will then uh, bit by bit uh, slump down to the horizon with uh, um, Venus following it. And you'll be able to see the blue-white star Vega sort of moving up in the sky as Venus slides down. And uh, as much as Venus is actually moving, one of the, the things to um, try and keep in mind is, is that it's actually the Earth that's moving. And every day um, we move about one degree. And that's, um, as you know, the year is 365 days and there's 360 degrees in a circle. So um, just keeping it simple, the Earth moves one degree a day around the sun, which from our perspective, uh, it looks like the stars are climbing up in the sky one degree a day. And with Venus moving along with us around the sun, it just appears to sort of hang, but the stars will move past it at about one degree a day. And I have one more uh, here, guide text, there we are. Um, and this is uh, showing uh, for the next few mornings at, uh, at 640, how uh, Mercury will become brighter and brighter over the next uh, few days. Uh, and then it hits a peak brightness of minus 0.7. So minus 0.7 is brighter than any of the um, stars that we'll see in the sky, except for Sirius, uh, which is uh, minus 1.4. But all the other really bright stars up in the sky are about zero magnitude. So it will be uh, fairly bright. However, because it's low in the twilight, it's not super obvious, but it, uh, at, at uh, your, your first guess will be that that's just a distant plane coming into land and it's like nope it's just gonna hang there and slowly uh, rise. Um, its altitude above the horizon uh, peaks in around its greatest elongation from the sun on the 10th and then it uh, uh, will drop fairly quickly uh, but it'll maintain its uh, peak brightness. So this is a reverse of what we'll see in, I believe it's February, uh, when uh, we'll see a really good evening apparition of Mercury. It, we'll see essentially a mirror image of all this. And um, uh, that is uh, the, the, really the, the short of it all. I wanted to um, cover a little less um, today because I think the, the last couple, uh, I've had uh, one extra thing to uh, talk about and I've been, uh, uh, the, the sessions have gone on just that little bit uh, too long. So um, I'd like to uh, uh, open it up for uh, questions anybody has and uh, um, whether it's about uh, tonight's topics or um, things in the sky that are gonna be coming up. Uh, soon. And speaking of that, Jeff is going to be talking about what's up in the sky for November uh, next week. So uh, we'll uh, have uh, some more uh, neat reminders in there. Oh, uh, actually, I do have one more thing I was going to show. And that... Uh, Hopefully you'll be able to see uh, this animation once the screen moves out of the way. Uh, yeah, meteor showers as seen from space. This is a pretty cool um, uh, animation. Just slow that down a bit. Um, you can get vertigo very easily. <laughs> if I swing this by a little too fast, you can look at it from upside down, 
cut through the solar system. Um, I always like seeing it from above slightly. You can zoom in and out. And um, in this case, uh, what uh, I'm uh, showing here is the Leonid uh, meteor shower. And um, it's uh, coming in uh, next uh, month. Let to zoom out a little bit there. So um, there's Earth going in through there. And so we slam into it in uh, November when the uh, particles from the dust particles from the tail of the comet uh, Temple Tuttle uh, pass through this area and the earth just cuts right through and uh, they burn up in the uh, upper atmosphere. But it's kind of neat to sort of see that, that they actually um, orbit in the, in the same direction as the uh, comet. So a uh, cool way of, uh, of looking at that. And you can see why the Leonids are one of the fastest uh, meteor showers, because when the Earth intersects the stream, you can see we're going in the opposite direction. We're coming face on. So that's uh, at 70 kilometers per second that we sweep through the stream of uh, the dust particles. So, um, with that, uh, happy lunar watching. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, just uh, unmute yourself. And... Yeah, Alistair, I got a question. Um, it's Al here. Uh, just wondering whether uh, in a Small, large telescope, uh, in, will Mercury appear as a disk, um, as a point? At what point does it switch from one to the other? It, it, Mercury is relatively small. It's only, it's typically only about, um, geez, uh, five or six arc seconds. Um, the best that even the, the best, uh, imagers out there can get is just sort of dusky features, um, which have been um, properly uh, correlated to actual spacecraft. But let's just see. Yeah, there we go. Five and a half arc seconds diameter. So Jupiter's disk is um, up in the 40 arc seconds. Mars at the moment is, what are we down to, Abder? Are we down to about 18 arc seconds for Mars? I haven't checked too recently, but uh, I would assume probably about 18 to 20, somewhere around there. Yeah, so it's another sort of four times smaller in, in apparent uh, disk size. So uh, the other thing uh, that uh, Mercury, uh, because it, st it always is hugging the horizon, um, there's, you're looking through more atmosphere and the um, uh, so so the seeing is typically worse. Um, most people find that they get a better view of Mercury uh, after sunrise uh, when it's uh, higher in the sky and the uh, contrast isn't so glaring. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, a tough one to see anything more than its phase. That's the the really the remarkable um, change and. Um, that's what we'll be seeing. Let's see, where are we at? November 20th, if I zoom in here, I'll be able to. There it is in November 20th. Um, and if I just move that forward. Oh, shoot, you can't see this, can you? I'm not sharing my screen. Ha. Huh. Okay. Uh, let's try this the right way. There we go. Um, there's Mercury. If we kick this forward, um, that was on the 20th. Um, we're uh, slowly heading into uh, full phase. 
uh, as uh, over the next little while. So uh, let's get back to later this weekend, if you can go to planet Mercury. So if you looked at it uh, tomorrow morning, uh, you'll see a crescent. And uh, because of that, uh, it will be closer to us than um, average. So the disc will also be bigger. So almost nine arc seconds. So about half the apparent size of Mars uh, currently. So it will, over the next uh, two weeks, it will shrink and become more of um, a rounder, more gibbous. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough one being low in the sky, but you might find it, uh, especially uh, if you've got a, a tracking uh, mount, uh, just keep following it into the day as, as long as you can, and you might find that you'll get moments of, uh, of decent seeing. Thanks. And you would be able to see that in daylight, or is this before sunrise? Um, it's before sunrise uh, to the eye, visually, is uh, when uh, you're going to be um, seeing um, Mercury, uh, uh, just with the eye or with binoculars, when it's relatively low uh, to the horizon, here would be the sun. But if you have a uh, tracking telescope that uh, once you're on Mercury and you just keep letting it track, um, one even into daylight, you'll find that you'll be able to uh, see uh, um, probably uh, a little bit more detail. But it's uh, with because the you're looking through less atmosphere. But and it's separ it's separated from the sun that it's safe to observe. That's right. Yes. Uh, in, in this case, even uh, as we hit. Uh, early on in uh, in November, it's 13 degrees from the sun, um, and uh, at greatest elongation, which will be on the 10th of November. It's not hugely farther, 19 degrees from the sun, more or less. Um, so uh, um, it's uh, uh, it's. It'll be safe as long as your telescope is uh, not loose and uh, can accidentally swivel to point anywhere close to the sun. But, uh, yeah, binoculars are uh, a good way of following it. But there, with binoculars, you'll just really, the only thing you can see is the motion. You can't see the uh, phase of Mercury with, uh, with binoculars but relative to the blue-white star spica, um, you'd be able to see motion. This is Ed here. Mm -hmm. uh, I found your uh, uh, discussion on the faces of the moon very interesting. The phenomena is essentially the same as what people in lifeboats or in sailing boats here. Uh, the humans are uh, programmed to hear voices, the, that uh, frequency range of voices. That's what they're always looking for. And if you're out in a, a sailboat uh, with the wind and the, the wave noise, you're automatically going to pick up the frequencies of voices and you're going to think that you're hearing somebody talking or a radio playing in the background but you're just picking out the frequencies of all these thousands of frequencies caused by the wind and the and the waves that which uh, would it makes a lot of sense because uh, 
um, not not my uh, with my current furnace, but with my previous furnace, when it would go on with the fan in the background and the the echoing in the the vents every now and then, just like sounds like there's a conversation happening in the kitchen, and it's like oh, no one's there. Yeah, exactly the same. Yeah. Hi, Alistair. Mm -hmm. uh, here. Um, so regarding the first picture uh, you were showing us about the phases of the moon, am I the only one that sees a T-Rex there? Uh, I've always just seen a T-Rex and I've never been able to see any of the other ones, but now I guess I won't be able to stop seeing Wilma on there. But uh, I always just saw a T-Rex. I see the, the mouth at the end and there's the body, the tiny stumpy little hands, the legs, and then uh, even a tail behind it right at that left edge. Uh, so I've always just seen the T-Rex, and I don't know if I was the only one seeing that. Anyone else ever seen that? No? Huh. That's interesting. <laughs> well, uh, so, uh, it, well, that'll be neat. Um, if you can, uh, make a little drawing of it the, the next time, and then yeah. we'll line it up with the moon. And uh... I did actually do that. I'd, uh, I'd drawn it on there on a picture I'd taken of the moon. I'll share that sometime as well. Because I, I, I just always see a T-Rex. I always had a hard time seeing any man on the moon. I could never picture that, but I always saw a T-Rex. So I'll share that on the Astro list. Because <laughs> that'll be good, especially for outreach with the kids, because I think <laughs> yeah. T-Rex on the moon is a lot better than Wilma <laughs> Flintstone, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. yeah now, that, now that you mentioned that, I see the T-Rex there also. <laughs> Yeah, I was looking at uh, it the other well, a couple of weeks ago, and I, for me, I noticed that uh, it resembled the outlines, at least, of the dark and the Maria represent the continent of Africa. So in the pictures that you have up there right now, Alistair, we have uh, sort of South Africa to the, at about the 230 position. Um, and then the, uh, yes, up there. And then uh, Mar Maria Chrysium could be, uh, I suppose, uh, was it Madagascar, the island off the coast? Oh, okay, and, yeah. So this, then, oh, this this is the so the Atlantic is down. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And Ty Tycho, the crater Tycho, would of course be a tropical depression that would be forming <laughs> off the uh, <laughs> western coast. So yeah, yeah in it, in this sort of scenario, I guess um, uh, Egypt and Cairo would be sort of at the uh, nine o'clock limb, roughly. Mm-hmm. No, that, that's neat. Because, um, you know, saying about the, the continents, that, that is one of the things that, um, yeah, in the Renaissance, there is a lot of thought that, well, of course, those were seas, which is why they're called the Maria. Uh, but um, people uh, saw the Mediterranean in the shape, and they were assuming the moon, of course, of course, is a perfect uh, sphere and is just reflecting the earth and since they uh, were uh, very uh, uh, Mediterranean centric in those days uh, they thought oh yeah that's that's actually sort of not similar to the shape of the Mediterranean and those those sailors must have their cartography wrong <laughs> in that scenario um, the Mediterranean would where would uh, the Italy, the boot of Italy be? Uh, I, I think this is the boot in, in through here. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah the, but it's uh, yeah, a bizarre thing where it's just like, that really isn't all that close to the Mediterranean. So, um, but of, of course it's one of the, that's the classic problem of, uh, um, of the early astronomy when you don't have any hard details you make things up to fit your uh, current uh, view yeah very neat well uh thank you uh, everyone for uh, joining in and uh Remember, uh, next week at uh, this time, uh, Jeff will be doing his What's Up uh, in the Sky this month. And uh, we will uh, catch you later. Okay. Everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you. Thank you very much.